Well, if you would, turn in your New Testament to uh, John chapter 7. We're going to continue our study in the book of John. Next week, we are going to have uh, services on the normal day, the normal time. Of course, we're going to have singing that uh, Wednesday. That's the last Wednesday of the month, so we need to be remembering that in our announcements. But we are... It's not... And two Wednesdays, sorry, and two Wednesdays. So we have one more. I was thinking, I was getting ahead of myself. Thank you. Uh, Christmas Eve, we're going to have services as normal. We're going to have our singing like we normally do. And uh, it's an excellent opportunity for people to, if you have family, come in, introduce them to New Testament Christianity. Let them hear what it means to truly worship God in spirit and in truth in song. And so... Uh, that's going to be on Christmas Eve. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So that's in two weeks. Two weeks from now. Do what? Okay, that's what messed me up. I'm sorry. That's what, that's what messed me up when you said two weeks. Next week is Christmas Eve. So are we going to be singing then? No, no, no. We're going to, what I was saying is we're having services as normal. Okay, we're not going to change services for Christmas Eve. So here, here is the correct version of things. That threw me off the whole, next week, Christmas Eve, we're going to have our Bible class like normal. Then after that, which will be in two weeks, we will have our singing like normal, but then we can stay afterwards and see the new year in. Those who want to stay, bring games, uh, food, whatever, y'all ladies get together and figure that out. So that, that's what was throwing me off. I, I, I was thinking end of the month, got those things mixed up. So we'll get it figured out. My point was we're not changing our service for Christmas. It's a man-made holiday. And no, we're not going to have a mass, Becky. And so we are, we're, not, we're not going to do that. We're not going to accommodate uh, the things of this world, and it's an excellent opportunity if you have friends or relatives to bring them to hear the truth of God's word. That's my point, eventually. John chapter 7. <clears throat> Would you pray with me? Great God and Father, we thank you so very much for this opportunity to assemble together and study your word and study from the life of your son. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to follow his example, to have his mind, his compassion, his mercy and tenderness, his boldness, his strength in our life. We repent, Father, where we fall short in that. We are sorry for our sins and we ask for your forgiveness. And as we study your son tonight, help us to always strive as individual Christians and as a congregation to follow that great example. Bless our children and bless all the teachers that are teaching. Bless this church here. Help us to be strong. We pray for those who are sick and are dealing with ongoing illnesses in their life, that you'll bless them and give them strength. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for this rain that you've blessed us with. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. John chapter 7, as we mentioned before, in John 7 and 8, the hostility towards Jesus is beginning to uh, heat up. It's beginning to uh, become volatile. And they're seeking to kill him. And Jesus went to the Feast of Tabernacles uh, in a secret way. But then he was found, and uh, they're having discussions with him, and uh, making it clear that most of the Jewish people are not believing in him, especially the leadership, but others are believing. And there's, just, there's division among the Jewish people at this point as to who, who he is, who is this Jesus of Nazareth. And, and therefore, Jesus, on the last day of the feast, verse 37 through 39, says, On the last day, that great day of the feast... Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. 
He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now he's talking about uh, the blessings that come from the spiritual water that he would provide. And in the wilderness, when they were wandering in the wilderness... Uh, God did provide physical water for them uh, when they were in need of that water. But he's using water here, of course, in a a symbolic sense to talk about the blessings uh, that would come from uh, him that would flow out to everyone else. And he has reference here to the Holy Spirit. We are people of the Holy Spirit. That's because we follow what the Spirit tells us to do as revealed in the scriptures. We should not be uh, apprehensive about referring to the fact that as Christians, we are people of the Holy Spirit when it's understood scripturally, when it's understood biblically. And so the Holy Spirit would be given. It's a promise made specifically to the apostles in John chapters 13 through 16, that they would receive the miraculous empowerment of the Holy Spirit to teach them further what He didn't teach them while He was on earth because He was going back to heaven to be glorified, to reign at the right hand of the Father so the church could be established, the kingdom. Well, we see that that happened to the apostles in Acts chapter 2. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit and they had the miraculous powers and they had the ability to work miracles. That was a miraculous manifestation of the outpouring of the Spirit. Then you had the apostles lay hands on people to give them spiritual gifts in the first century. You find that in Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 8, and Acts chapter 19. That was limited to the first century. But every person received the Spirit when they obey the gospel. And that is a part of the blessing that comes to us. It's nothing miraculous. There's nothing, it has nothing to do with um, the touchy-feely emotionalism of Pentecostalism or denominationalism. It's not, not involved in that at all. It's when we receive the word of God that the Spirit gave, then we have the Spirit of God in us. But that wasn't going to happen until Jesus was glorified. And that was going to be a blessing for everyone else. Because we are people of the Holy Spirit, and we bear the fruit of the Spirit in our life, John, excuse me, Galatians 5, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, not the works of the flesh, we are an outflow of blessing for our family and for everyone else around us. It's an outflowing. So that concept of a river flowing is what he's referring to. But he's taking it from Old Testament imagery that speaks of God being a blessing of living water. Look at Isaiah. Turn in your Old Testament to Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 3. Isaiah 12 and verse 3. This whole chapter, Isaiah 12, only has six verses in it. And it's a hymn of praise to God. And it says, uh, beginning in verse 1, In that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Now look at verse 3. Therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So there's that concept of water being used as a symbol of salvation. It is a blessing to those who come and they draw those uh, water, that water from the wells of salvation. Look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. Jeremiah 2.13 They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. 
This verse here is dealing with the, the, the unfaithfulness of the people. And he says, God says to the prophet Jeremiah that they have forsaken me. I'm the fountain of living water. I'm what will give them the spiritual blessings that they need. But they've forsaken me and they have hewn out for themselves cisterns that are broken that can hold no water. Now, what's another word for cisterns? Well. Well. Uh, one of the important things uh, when you go to establish in a community or you move into an area is to get water, especially in a place where water is scarce. You want to find water as one of the first resources that you will need for yourself and for your livestock. Well, uh, there is a fountain of living water that's there, and you reject that and hewn out yourself wells that are broken that can hold no water. The symbolism is quite clear. They've forsaken God to go after idols. And the false religion of idolatry can hold no water. It cannot provide the blessings that only the true God can give. And they're looking for those blessings in all the wrong places. And so we see the imagery there and we see the application for us today as well. If we forsake God and go after other religious activities that's not according to God's will then we are forsaking the living water for something that could hold no water. Look at Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. Verse 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord the fountain of living waters. There again is that expression. Jesus is applying this to himself. Now, this is something that's interesting as well because he is saying that he is the one that can provide this living water. He's identifying himself as God because only God can provide this living spiritual water. So he is identifying himself as deity by that very expression in and of itself. Also, you come into uh, verses we've already looked at. John chapter 4, when he was with the woman at the well there in Samaria. He's already used this expression before. John 4, verse 10 and 11. He asked the woman for uh, something to drink. And she's surprised in verse 9 that him being a Jew would talk to her, a woman of Samaria. And in verse 10, John 4 and verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was who says to you, Give him, give a drink, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. That expression goes back to these Old Testament passages we've looked at. And then in verse 11, it says, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Look at verse 14. Uh, Whoever drinks of this water that I shall give him, Jesus said, will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So there that expression is again. I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing to other people. I'm going to bless you and and what is given to you, you are going to, uh, of course, share with other people. And of course, that entails and implies evangelism. Bringing people to that living water. Helping them know uh, Jesus Christ, the only source that can quench their thirst. The only one that can uh, save them from their sins and provide for them life. So uh, verses 37 through 39 of John chapter 7 is rich with Old Testament imagery. And, And Jesus is identifying himself once again as the exclusive one who can provide them with this living water. Now verses 40 through 44... You see here, people again are, are concerned about him and, and are confused. 
It says, Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David, from Bethlehem, uh, and the from the town of Bethlehem where David was and there was a division among the people because of him now some of them wanted to take him but no one laid hands on him remember earlier in the chapter they had already dispatched the Pharisees and the chief priests verse 32 officers to take him they're ready to have him arrested they are ready to get him out of there but at this point they're not going to take him and the people are, are confused. And notice their confusion there in verse 40 and 41. Truly, this is the prophet. <coughs> and others said, this is the Christ. In their minds, there are two different people that's going to come. The prophet and the Christ. But according to the scriptures, the prophet would be the Christ. Christ would be the prophet that would come. And of course, in their minds, they're talking about the prophecy of Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. This one special prophet that God was going to raise up who was going to be like Moses. He was going to be a lawgiver and he was going to be a deliverer. That's what Christ was and is. A lawgiver. He gives his New Testament law. And a deliverer delivers us from our sins. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from the midst of your brethren. And him shall you hear. Verse 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you among their brethren. And I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. So, of course, we know that this indeed uh, is talking about Jesus Christ because of Acts chapter 3 and verse 23. Peter specifically speaks of that prophecy and says this is talking about Jesus. So, when they say this is the prophet And not just prophet, the prophet. And in the English, it's the capital P prophet. They're referring to this prophecy of Deuteronomy chapter 18. But what they fail to realize is the scriptures, when you take all the scriptures of the Old Testament, the prophet is also the Christ. Also the Messiah. In their minds, they were two separate people. But based on their misunderstanding. That's why it says in verse 41 of John 7, others said, this is the Christ. This is the Christ. Now, this concept of the Christ, of course, you find it a lot in Daniel. But Psalm 2 is exactly where you find David talking about the anointed. If you look at Psalm 2 in your Old Testament, this is a prophecy about Jesus. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. They're against the anointed. The Lord and His anointed. Well, that's the Hebrew word for Messiah. And the Greek equivalent to that is Christ. And so when it talks about the Christ, it's talking about the Messiah. And this is the prophet that would be speaking God's will. And notice what they say there back in John chapter 7 and verse uh, 42 or verse 41. Will Christ come out of Galilee? This is going to come up again a little bit later on. Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the seed of David? Well, yes. Yes, that's true. He's going to come from the seed of David. He is a descendant of King David. From the town of Bethlehem. Yes, that's where he was born. Exactly where he was born. Where David was. 
So there was a division among the people because of him. It was prophesied he would be of the seed of David. It was prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem. And that's exactly what happened according to the scriptures. And the people are divided uh, over him because of this. Now in verse 44, Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Now notice the reaction of the people that went there to arrest Jesus. Verse 45, Then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. They were so impressed with Jesus that they could not fulfill their mission to arrest him and take him in. No man ever spoke like this man. You know, I've been privileged in my life to hear some great preachers, preachers that I respect that I, I still listen to their recordings to this day. Some of them aren't with us anymore. Uh, I think of Johnny Ramsey. Uh, I think of uh, some that are still with us, B.J. Clark. Uh, other great men who I think who are great speakers, Frank Chesser, um, that are just people I love to listen to. I love to hear them preach. And they're such an encouragement to me. And you've got your own list of people who you like to listen to who are impressive to you and, and, and you uh, receive a, uh, an encouragement from. But I would have loved to have heard Jesus preach. Of course, I'd have to understand the, the language in which he preached. But I, I would have loved to hear him preach. He must have been the master at speech and conveying the message. There probably never has ever been a more eloquent preacher than our Lord. So much so that his enemies, they were going there to arrest him. They're enthralled. So much so that we can't arrest him. We're going to go back empty handed. They were willing to get in trouble because of, listen to him, no one ever spoke like this man. When you look at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. What does it say of Jesus? Matthew chapter 7, after he gave this sermon. It says in verse 28 and 29, Matthew 7, 28 and 29, And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teachings. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Jesus was a bold preacher that preached the word the perfect preacher that conveyed the message like it should have been conveyed and even earlier when he's speaking to them those who were sent to arrest him or those who were his enemies they hadn't been dispatched yet the people are watching Jesus in his courage and it says in John 7, verse 25 and 26, Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly. And they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? So he's speaking boldly to his enemies. So you see there uh, that, that Jesus was a Im- very impressive uh, individual. And one who spoke in a very impressive way so that those officers that were sent to arrest him couldn't do it. Verse 46, no man ever spoke like this man. And that, that's probably, they didn't realize how true that statement was. No one's ever spoke like this man. He, he was the greatest philosopher the greatest preacher, the greatest theologian, the greatest teacher that has ever walked the face of the earth. No man ever spoke like him. But notice the reaction of the Pharisees. Then the Pharisees answered and said, Are you also deceived? He tricked you too? 
Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But the crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Well, that's a real good reason to not believe in Jesus. Because look at all the Pharisees. They haven't believed in him. Has any one of the rulers believed in him? So look, look at those of us who are supposed to know it better than you do. We don't believe in him. And this crowd that doesn't know the law is accursed. That means they're cut off from God. They, they don't even know what they're talking about. So you see the condescending attitude of the Jewish leaders towards these officers who were very much uh, impressed with uh, the preaching and the teaching of Jesus. But there was a Nicodemus there in verse 50 who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, uh, said to them, he's one of the uh, Pharisees, one of the rulers, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? And they answered and said to him, are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. Now again, they're using faulty reasoning here. Just because a prophet hasn't risen out of Galilee, does that mean that God can't raise a prophet out of Galilee? By the way, I mean, he grew up in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. He had all the credentials that they were looking for as far as the Christ. He's a prophet. He's uh, one who uh, is preaching to us uh, the will of God. He's performing all these signs and miracles. And Nicodemus is trying to use a little bit of reasoning here. He's one of the reasonable Pharisees. He's the one that went to Jesus by night in John chapter 3 and talked to him. So we know that you're a teacher come from God because no one can do the, the signs that you do unless God is with him. He, he, he saw the logical connection between what Jesus was doing and him being someone special. You're from God. We know that much. Or Nicodemus knew that much. And that's when Jesus talked to him about being born again. You've got to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, here we see Nicodemus again being rational, not getting caught up in the frenzy of the, the hatred and the emotion of the people. He says, listen, does our law judge a man before it hears him? We need to listen to him first to know what he's doing. So we need to hear him out. We need to listen to it. And Yes. It could be. If you have a reference. Yeah, 13, 17, 11, 13, 13, 17, verse 1. First Kings 17, verse 1. Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, Is Gilead a, another, the uh, same as Galilee in the uh, New, New Testament? I think so. So, I mean, the, you know, if, if, if what this is saying is true here about him being out of Gilead and that being Galilee in the New Testament, then that shows the, the ignorance of the rulers who are telling the crowd they don't know the law. Well, they don't know the Scriptures. And even if there had never been a prophet come out of Galilee, so what kind of reasoning is that to reject Jesus just because it's never happened before? So their 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 minds made up. Their their hatred and their and their envy of Christ is building and mounting. And when we get into chapter eight here, it, we're going to see that it's going to grow even more. So, verse fifty three says, "And everyone went to his own house." Before we get into chapter eight, does anybody have any question or comment about chapter seven? That we've been looking at. So we see here chapter 7, the, uh, the feast of uh, the tabernacles and how Jesus went up there secretly but took opportunities to teach the people that were there. And, and the people are, are back and forth about who is this person? Who is he? And of course, they're, they're forming their understanding of Jesus as he's teaching more and more. 
Now, in verses 1 through 11 of John chapter 8, you're going to find a passage of Scripture that is very much misunderstood and used incorrectly to basically say we can't judge other people. It's kind of like the passages that deal with judging that we looked at before, John 7, 24, judge with righteous judgment, what that means. The woman caught in the act of adultery. It says in verse 1, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he, be, he came uh, again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. That was a normal custom of a rabbi to sit down and teach the people uh, the message. Verse 3, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst... They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? Now here's their motive, verse 6. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. So they continued asking him, He raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman. And he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers of yours? The accusers of yours. Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, I want to talk about what people think this is saying before we analyze it and see what it's actually saying. People think this passage is meaning that you're not perfect, I'm not perfect, and if you say someone is committing adultery or some sin, because of that, you shouldn't be throwing stones. You've heard the expression, don't throw stones in a glass house. Well, if you start throwing stones and condemning someone else, you're going to shatter your own house. You're, you're, you're condemning yourself. And Jesus is saying here, you are not perfect, Therefore, you can't judge anyone else, and therefore, we should just be forgiving. We should be forgiving. Now, I've had this verse used several times, or this passage of Scripture used in that manner. And um, a lot of times, people who are uh, liberal on divorce and remarriage, on what Jesus taught on that, will go to this verse here and to show Jesus isn't concerned about legally keeping the law he's more concerned about mercy and having mercy on this woman not about the strict requirements of the law and so we shouldn't be concerned about the strict requirements of what the new testament says about divorce and remarriage we should just have mercy like jesus had mercy that's not what this is teaching at all and a close analysis of it makes it very clear to see what that is. As we go back and look at verse um, 2, Jesus came early in the morning, came to teach in the temple. The scribes and the Pharisees brought him a woman caught in adultery, and they set her in the midst. Now, let's stop right there, and let's go back to the Old Testament law. What does the Old Testament say when you catch somebody in adultery? Look at Leviticus Leviticus 20. Leviticus 20 and verse 10. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Who was missing in John 8? The man. They didn't bring the man. They, bring the, they brought the woman. So they are sinning. Now if she was caught in the very act, he was there. 
He was there. But they took her and brought her to Jesus. Didn't get him. Okay. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. If a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. The, the man that lay with the woman and the woman, you shall put away the evil from Israel. So both of them should die. The man and the woman, you put away the evil from Israel, they are both to be put to death. Verse 24, you bring them out to the gate of the city, you shall stone them to death with stones. Um, talks about the manner of execution there, and that's why they, they're wanting to know if she's to be stoned or not, put to death by stoning or not. Okay, so De Deuteronomy 22, verse 22, and Leviticus 20 and verse 10, both say that you bring them both. You bring them both. Well... The first sin that those who brought her to Jesus committed, they didn't follow procedure. So they were in the wrong in bringing her to Jesus without the man. They were violating the law of Moses. Notice also, too, their motive. Verse 6. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. They're looking for him to say something or to mess up so they can grab hold of it. And so their motive was impure. Another thing, this is brought to Jesus and not before a court. The laws of Moses were to be brought before a court, a sentence was to be passed, and then they were to execute them. Jesus wasn't a witness to anything, according to the law of Moses. They brought, G they brought this woman before Jesus for the purpose of trying to s snare him. So their motives were impure. So here are the sins that are going on there. This is a mob decision. This is not a court decision. And so they're looking for uh, something to accuse Jesus of. Jesus kind of ignores them at first. He stoops down and writes them there. By the way, this is the only time we see Jesus ever writes anything himself personally. When he's writing in the dirt. This is the only time it's recorded that Jesus writes anything in the gospel accounts. Now in verse 7, when he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you... Let him throw a stone at her first is referring to what they were doing. Bringing her before him with impure motives, without the man, all of that was sinful. All of that was sinful. Jesus is not saying, unless you're perfect, you cannot execute someone else. You had executions in the Old Testament of imperfect people executing people who were worthy of death. Do you realize under the Old Testament law, there were 16 crimes that were punishable by the death penalty. And those who died from either breaking the Sabbath or homosexuality or adultery, who committed those crimes worthy of death, those people who stoned them and executed them, they were impure people in the sense of having sinned themselves. So he's not talking about you've got to be perfectly sinless to do this. He's talking about what they're doing in bringing the woman to him was sinful. The way they did it was sinful. They didn't follow procedure. So when he says, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. He was convicting them of what they were doing. And then they started dropping the stones. They went out among them one by one, the oldest to the last. Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. Now, notice she was standing. You ever watch these movies where she's thrown down on the ground and she's on the ground weeping 
and tattered, and Jesus comes over there and puts... That's not what the Bible says. What does it say? The woman standing in the midst. We've got to stick with what the Scripture says. Verse 10. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, Jesus was the one who was stooped down because he was riding in the dirt there. Woman, where are your accusers of yours? Where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Now, that means according to the law of Moses, have you been condemned worthy of death? She said, no one, sir. Neither do I condemn you. That means I can't execute you. You haven't been found guilty by the ones who caught you in the very act. He, so he's not saying, I don't condemn you in that you didn't sin, because he goes on to say, um, go and sin no more. He doesn't let her off the hook. He's in, in fact telling her, you need to repent. Repent. No, the law of Moses' procedure was not followed. That was the sin of the people that brought her. The scribes and the Pharisees were in sin and what they did in bringing her to Jesus. Jesus said, I can't condemn you. I can't condemn you according to the law of Moses. But you go your way and you sin no more. Now, I think some brethren think this says, go your way and sin some more. The reason why is because they think if you have someone that's in adultery, you just baptize them and let them go on committing adultery. Let them continue in that sinful marriage or that sinful lifestyle. But Jesus is telling her you need to repent. You go your way and sin no more. So John 8 verses 1 through 11, we see here the people were in sin in what they were doing. And bringing this woman to Jesus to catch Jesus. Their motive was wrong. It was impure. They brought her without the man. That was wrong. That was sinful. This was a mob decision. This was not a court decision. That was sinful. So when Jesus mentioned the fact, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone. In other words, He's saying, if you're doing this right, execute her. That's what he was saying. If you're doing this right, according to God's will, and you really think you are, you execute her. You kill her. And they knew they weren't. They knew that he had convicted them. He, they knew their motives weren't pure. That's why the oldest left first. There's a little bit of wisdom with age. The oldest left left first because they knew they, they weren't doing this right they knew this whole thing was a trap that's all it was it was a trap to see what Jesus would do it's kind of like later on where they're, they're going to ask Jesus should we pay taxes to Caesar or not see what he would say they thought they would trap him and Jesus turned it around on them and so Jesus handled this brilliantly. He knew what was going on there. He turned it around on them. And then he showed compassion by telling her, you need to stop this sinning. You go your way and you sin no more. So he's in essence telling her that she needs to repent. Okay. Next week is Christmas Eve. We will have class as normal. That was the point I was trying to make at the beginning of class. Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we will have class, and we will continue in the book of John. And so we'll continue in John 8 next week, Lord willing.